Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Did you have a good weekend? Good. We had a very good weekend in fruit at the Fruit of Fall Festival. <clears throat> we uh, set up Friday afternoon and went through Friday evening and all day yesterday. And, the, and thanks to Stanley, put that little video together to show what it looked like. Um, we had all of our unique handmade African gifts. We had a lot of people come to the booth, quite, sold quite a few items and also, but more than anything, we had a chance and opportunity to talk to quite a number of people that we've never seen before and being able to share the gospel and share what we're doing and here and, and in Africa. Anyway, so thank you for praying. And again, for many of you, uh, we at Hope Bible Chapel and our Monument Leadership Institute in Africa are have come under Go Give Hope. They adopted us last year, and so we're thankful for that. So if you do come to the um, banquet, we'll be there as well, explain a little bit about what we're doing. And so anyway, Pastor Jeff was going to be gone, and he had asked me if I'd preach for him this morning. And I said, what I'd love to do is I'd love to come, and I would love to share about our most recent trip to Africa. It was last, end of June, first part of July. And so we we're going to be in First Timothy. So you can open your Bibles to First Timothy. And we're going to, uh, as we go through 1 Timothy, I'm going to reflect on our last trip, our previous trip to Kenya, and I want to tie it into the importance of the Word of God and the gospel message we preach and the gospel mission which we live from 1 Timothy. But in the meantime, I'm going to invite you to Africa. And what is the name of uh, Mika's village? I forget. Do you remember? Oh, the Church of Silver Bell. Okay, welcome to the Church of Silver Bell. So you can turn to the next slide. And um, anyway, when you when you come there, you're going to, first of all, the first thing you're going to hear is the amps cranked up, okay? And that's how, do they, that's how they sort of announce that church is starting. And they will maybe sing for an hour and have the music going for an hour and people start beginning to gather. So that is the worship team. That is one of the young men that Pastor Mika is discipling. And so I get to disciple Mika, and Mika is discipling him. So it's a beautiful thing. Anyway, next slide. You will also see this since they're one-room tin huts. They do not have Sunday school room. So there's the Sunday school class. So you children, welcome to the Sunday school class. And um, that's how they do. Fortunately, they have chairs. We've been at places where they don't have chairs, and they sit on the ground, but here they do have chairs. Let's, next slide. Um, there is, they love to praise the Lord, Buana Asifiwe. The word Buana is the word for Lord. Asifiwe is the Lord be praised. And so they love to praise Jesus. They love to sing. They, they always stand because they move. They dance. Their bodies cannot stay still when they sing. Um, that's, they just got rhythm. It's deep within their soul. And uh, after this, I would get up and preach. And anyway, we don't have a picture of that, so we go to the next one. And afterwards, we always they hang out in fellowship. Often the gals will hang out with the gals, guys with guys. Um, they don't talk about politics or guns or things that we talk about because their government is no help and they don't have guns. So um, they talk about things that are more important to them and how they live life in Eastern Africa and Kenya. Anyway, you see the little yellow tub there? That's their form of helping out with COVID, a little hand washing before you go into the building. Um, they, they do, the government was pressing them a little bit to be careful, and at t for a time they shut down the churches. So anyway, so welcome to Silver Bell. That was our morning we spent there. We also spent a couple days there um, ministering the word to this village and to the people there. You can go to the next slide. Now, this is Pastor Mika. That's his church. Pastor Mika, he is a tailor. So what Pastor Mika does is, um, you can go to the next slide. He, uh, that's his wife, Matilda. He, he sews for a living. That's what he does. They're all self-supporting pastors. So this shirt is one that he gave me right the day I was leaving. And so he, he's one of these guys that is blessed. With just, he just needs a few hours sleep. And so he, he ministers during the day, cares for his family. That little coffee table, they live probably in like a 12 or 14 by 14 uh, brick, little brick home. I think they rent it. And um, that's his coffee table. As you can see, his study books, everything are out. But during the day, he would serve us tea on that table. Then at night, when all of his wife and children go to bed, he pulls out the sewing machine and he sews till probably two or three in the morning. And that's what he does. He's a tailor. And so he's self-supporting. So this was his gift to me on the day we we're leaving. And so that's why I wore it this morning to, uh, to share with you the blessing that I received from him. Yes, and you can go to the next slide. 
And so anyway, we're just going to look at a couple different points from 1 Timothy, and one is a gospel-centered message. And so let's first of all, let's read the first four verses from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can gather together today. And we gather together Jesus in your name and we gather together opening up and studying and embracing, believing, and living your word. Because your word is eternal and it's the only thing worth living for. Thank you for the salvation message that we get to bring to East Africa and to train these pastors and disciple these pastors to truly be men of God, warriors of the gospel, that they would affect the people around them, the communities around them, their own families, their friends, their tribes. God, we thank you for that opportunity. I also want to thank you for this weekend and the opportunity of sharing the gospel and the good news of people in our own community and how they need to be saved and born again and be turned from darkness to light. What an, op- what an opportunity, what a privilege to do this. Thank you again that for Go Give Hope. Thank you for the Cal- Calvary Chapel of Grand Junction, how they have embraced us. They've embraced our ministries. They are praying for us. They have, are helping us, and I want to thank you for it. And it's a blessing to be here this morning, to be able to bless them back with your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul, this first and second Timothy and Titus, these books are written from a commanding officer to a subordinate. Timothy was Paul's son in the faith. Paul was a soldier for Jesus Christ, period. And throughout first and second Timothy and Titus, Titus he uses military language. And he uses military, if you want to say position. So immediately in verse 1, he says, I'm an apostle. He doesn't call himself a servant here of Christ because he's using a military term. In other words, I'm an apostle by what? Of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God. God is the general. He is the leader. He has commanded me. He has called me and commanded me that I would be his apostle. He is one who saw Christ, who was saved by Christ, and is proclaiming the gospel of Christ. And now he says, Timothy, I'm that apostle. In other words, you need to listen to this. This is We're talking military here. I'm your commanding officer. I am. And anyway, he goes on to say, the, by, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Jesus Christ is our hope. We have no other hope. Is there another hope? Some people hope in government. Some people hope in the Denver Broncos and the Minnesota Vikings. That's me. But you know what? We will remember the name of the Lord our God. Because Jesus Christ is our hope. He's our only hope. Matter of fact, Colossians 1.27 tells us there's this great mystery that God revealed after the cross of Calvary. The good news of the gospel started going to Gentiles after it started going to the Jews. And it's Christ in us. Our hope of glory is Christ in us the Holy Spirit in us. Anyway, so he tells, calls Timothy his true son, but we, first Timothy was most likely written after Paul's impris- third missionary journey, his imprisonment in Rome. And he looks like, it appears like, he had a fourth missionary journey. He was back in Ephesus where he had been welcomed and spent a lot of time. Ephesus became a strong church, doctrinally strong because, man, they had, they had some great teachers there. Some, they had Paul there longer than he had been in any other place. And now he was being urged, he was being led to go to Macedonia, back to Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea in these places. And he says, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. Why? That you may charge some, and charge is a military word. This is a commission. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about this. There's no options. I charge you, Timothy, that you, guess what you do? You charge some that there is no other doctrine. 
The other doctrine means doctrine that is heresy, doctrine that is apart from sound doctrine, that's been accepted by the early church that Paul taught, that Peter taught, that James taught, that these men of God, these apostles taught. He says, because there was strange doctrine going on. And he says, and do not give heed, do not even listen. Don't even give a place to fables, that's myths, and endless genealogies. The Jewish people love their genealogies. We also have that in, in East Africa. It's about which tribe they're from. You know, there's certain characteristics of different tribes. Some are more warlike, some are more passive, some are servants, some are leaders. It just, it's crazy how this means a lot to people. We have that here, don't we? I'm proud to be what? I'm really proud to be a believer in Jesus Christ, period. Do you know why? I love America, but it's not going to last forever. And we're not called to preach our teaching of America. We're called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Amen? That's what we're called to preach. We can't save anybody, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and all to the Gentile. doesn't matter. doesn't matter what color skin. doesn't matter your background. It doesn't even matter what sins you've committed. Isn't that a glorious message? I had one missionary say, I thank God foreigners are coming into their country. We're so lazy as a church, we don't go to them, so God's bringing them to us because he wants them to hear the gospel. He's bringing them to our doorstep and they even have to learn English. Then we can preach to them because you know what? The joke is if you speak three languages, you're what? Trilingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak one language, you're American. (laughs) So they're even in East Africa, their required language in school is English. Wow, does that make it easy to preach? You know, the kids are learning English. But here... Paul is intense. He goes, I'm charging. This is a charge. Paul knew who these false teachers were. A couple of them were Hymenaeus and Alexander who who got kicked out of the church because of their false teachings. And he also knew what they were teaching. So Timothy knew who they were. We're just not given a lot of details, but we do know one thing. They, They, believe it or not, were preaching an early form of prosperity gospel. Because in chapter 6 of Timothy, one of the things they're teaching that is that godliness is a means of getting favor or gain, money. So using, if you want to say, Christianity or godliness as a form to get rich. And he tells Timothy to turn away from these people because they're, they're not born again. They don't have life in Christ. They, they're driven by greed. And so anyway, he's, he challenges him as a, as a soldier, as a, un, an underling in the military. He charges Timothy to carry this out because you know what this does in verse 4? These, these fables, these myths, these things that are not true and these endless genealogies, it doesn't matter, your, whether your, doesn't matter what your blood type is or where you're born from. It matters not at all. He says these things cause disputes. They cause arguing rather than godly edification, which is truly in the faith. Edification means to build one another up. Build one another up so that we would live for Jesus Christ and move forward with the gospel. Edification should have biblical results. It's just not so my life is easier. It's just so my life is godly and I live according to the word of God. But the reality is, have you ever argued with someone over politics? How many of you ever have argued over the vaccine? How many of you argued over sports? How many, how many of you have your opinion of sports? How many have your own opinions of, of, of government? What, is, what does God think of your opinions? What do you think God thinks of your opinions? Do you think he really cares? Remember when Peter said, when Peter was told by Jesus that I'm going to go to the cross, what did Peter do? Never, not so, Lord. And what did, what did Jesus say to him? He said, get behind me, Satan, for you do not savor the things of God. Peter, you have no clue what you're talking about. Keep your opinions to yourself and don't let the influence come from there rather than there. Right? So we have a tendency in America to be very opinionated. Well, I have an opinion on something. 
I have an opinion that the Word of God will last forever. And Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away, including America, but Jesus said, my words will not pass away. Ever. 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 How long is eternity? It's a long, 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 shut up. Pastor Mark, I could keep going on forever because for, eternity is forever. So in a thousand years from now, you're looking back, will your opinion matter? When you're a thousand years from now, you're in heaven with Jesus, will our opinions matter? It matters what the Word of God says because that's eternal. And so, yes, the challenge is strong. The, 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 the charge is hard. Timothy would suffer for his faith. And then he goes on. If you want, we, we want, you can go to the first one, change the slide. We see that though in verses 3 and 4 are gospel diversions. Now, verse 5, this is a picture of us studying the Word of God at night. And guess what we're talking about? The main problem in East Africa. And what is the wildfire that is spreading across East Africa? I will tell you in a moment, but you're going to have to try to guess. Anyway, next slide. But anyway, the gospel clarity, verses 5 through 7, really tell us now the purpose of the commandment is love. The purpose of the gospel, the purpose of the command to go forth is love. Love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and a sincere faith. When we look at these three things, we look at that love from a pure heart. Do I... As an unbeliever, as someone who's born dead in trespasses and sins, do I have a pure heart? I have a sin-saturated heart. Because I'm born dead in trespasses and sins. That's why I need to be born again. So someone, that love coming from a pure heart must be coming from love that is a heart that's been regenerated. And when you think of love, love is the greatest motivator. Why did God send His Son into this world? Because he loves sinners. He loves sinners. Yes, sinners, including us. We're sinners. You might think you're a better sinner than someone else, but not really. That's just your opinion, right? <laughs> We're born dead. How can a dead man be a better than another dead man, right? We all stink. We all smell of death. So we need life. So that, that person who's born again, even like Nicodemus who was religious, needed to be born again. Then he could love when they're born again. He love out of pure heart. For God so loved the world. That's all of us. It's more than the USA. It's the world. It's Muslims. It's Hindus. It doesn't matter. He loves them. For God so loved the world that he did what? His love motivated him to give his one and only son. And Jesus was so humble that he gave up the glories of heaven and humbled himself and became lower than the angels. He even lowered himself and submitted himself to sinful men who crucified him. That is humility. And that's who we're told to follow. So love love from a pure heart and a pure and it says in a good conscience can you have a good conscience apart from being cleansed by the blood of Christ no a good conscience comes it comes through being cleansed and forgiven in Christ filled with the holy spirit and now the holy spirit nudges me and moves me and empowers me and i try to live with a clear conscience has anybody ever here uh, uh, has not had a clear conscience? Come on now. I gotta be the first to raise my hand. Of course, because we've all struggled, right? We, we've all, and it says false teachers, what they have done is they've seared their consciences. They've seared them. They've hardened them. So when they look out on someone less than themselves, they, they don't care. They're there because of their own re. They're there because of this. They're there because of that. You, you go, to, go to a third world country and ask yourself how many choices they really have. So many things that, that have been given to them just by the, the birth of their, the family they're born into, the poverty, the sickness. They don't have choices. They can't lift themselves up by the bootstraps. It's impossible. They need Jesus. And they need someone there to love them and to be sensitive to their own conscience. And that's what the Lord does when, 
when you when I first went to Africa, my plan was not going back all the time. I just went there to, to meet the people and see what the needs were. And the Lord just put it on my heart to keep going back and keep ministering. And my love for them is too great. I've even prayed not to go back because it's easier to stay. And the passion to go runs so deep into my heart. I, I have to go. I have to. Because if I stayed back, I'd be hardening my heart and I would not have a clear conscience. And I want to have a clear conscience before the Lord. And a sincere faith, that's a, not a fakey faith, a real faith. Not a faith that has all this showy stuff on the outside, but a faith generated from that, that true belief and conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's coming back, he saves sinners. And the gospel message, the message of truth is so great. Well, anyway, verse 6, it says, there's those who have strayed. Instead of going to the right, they went left. They've turned aside to idle talk. That's meaningless talk, fruitless talk. It, it has no, there's no, you know, there's no power in it. There's no authority. It's just meaningless. In verse 7, it says, they desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. They don't even know what they're talking about. And here's, here's Paul. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Most likely, he was on the Sanhedrin. If he wasn't, he was going to be. He had everything going for him. He goes, when it came to the law, he goes, I was blameless. When it came to the Jewish law, the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, he was blameless. So these teachers, these, these guys come along and they start picking and choosing from the Old Testament verses that promote their false teaching. He says, he says they think they have an idea what they're talking about, but they don't. They're clueless. They're clueless. So anyway, what do you think is the wildfire in East Africa that's spreading? And it comes from directly from America. And it's all over Kenyan television, and it's radio, and it comes from America, and it's an infecting them like a disease, worse than COVID. What do you think it is? Anybody have an idea what it's in, the, the disease that they have there? Have, have, has Jeff ever mentioned the prosperity gospel or the word of faith movement or the name it and claim it? Yes. And these false teachers, and they are in Africa as well, they, they use the law, they pick and choose. They pick and choose parts of the law from the Old Testament, saying if you do this, God will bless you. If you give all your money and give up everything for Jesus, He's going to rain down blessing. You're going to have the early and latter rains. Food just going to drop out of the air. And, and the thing is, is, is Creflo Dollar. Now think about this. He, he's, he's African. His name is Creflo Dollar. Shouldn't that tell you something? Anyway, he says this. Quote, that, that when you pray... And you pray in faith, believing that you already possess it. You bound God to having to provide it for you. Name it. Claim it as though you have it. And you force God to answer that. What about the idea of Paul praying three times to, for that infirmity to leave? And God says, no, I want you to have that infirmity. And they do things and they say things like, this is from Peter and other leaders in Africa. They'll say things like, you have to understand the poverty and you're thinking, how could a prosperity gospel message work when people almost, they have nothing? You're so poor, you're so hungry, you have a lot of hunger pains, you do without all the time, and then now you're seeing on, on TV, your TV which is free, you're seeing all of these, how to call down blessing from heaven. Anyway, and so you're thinking, wow, there's a church there that this pastor has his own, own fancy car, four-wheel drive. He has, he has a, his whole entourage. He lives in a beautiful home. He has servants. And the, the poor people in the village think, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to be like that pastor. So the pastor, you go to his church because he's your idol now. And they don't know the Word of God. They don't have the Word of God. So the man gets up there and he quotes something from the law about if you follow God, he will bless you. So today, I know you might only have, 
uh, five, you know, five dollars worth of shekels, two dollars worth of shillings. But you give all of that, and God will bless you, and you will not have to worry about your next meal. He will take care of you. He will, he will, you'll take your money and give you ten times more than you've given today. Well, the question is, and so all these poor people come up because it's like the lottery. They know if there's just that one chance. So they bring, the, the, they bring their money to the pastor and they give it to the church. Who gets rich? The pastor. The pastor gets rich. They get poor. And they're, they're trying to figure out what's happened. My prayers aren't being answered. God has really favored my pastor. He's rich. God has favor upon him, but he doesn't favor me because I don't have anything. I must not have any faith. I'm not even worthy to go there and they don't go anywhere then and they live poorly and without hope because they don't know Christ. Because that false teacher, has what he has shared with them is called a prosperity gospel. And those poor people are still poor and yet poorer. I work with pastors that desire to be servants. So when they're given gifts from us, they go out and they share them with the people because they don't want to be someone up here who thinks they're above everybody else. And so, does this make me mad? Do you think God is pleased with this? No. The message of salvation is not one of riches. It's one of being a servant. Paul said, or John says, we lay down our lives for our brothers. That means we lower ourselves below our brother and we show more honor to our brother than we do ourselves. That's Jesus' way. That's what he did for us. He gave up heaven so that we can enjoy him forever and be blessed with eternal riches forever. Not earthly riches, not earthly treasure. That's all going to go away. But eternal treasure in Christ. Anyway, and so these preachers desire to be teachers of the law. But what does Paul say in verse 8? But we know the law has a purpose. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this. That the law is not made for a righteous man. That's one who's been born again because he's already righteous. But it's for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, uh, homosexuals, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. Paul names a number of sin here, and he leaves room for more. And what Paul says is what the law does, is the law is meant to show us that we can't keep it. If you remember, Sam, how many remember Sam Rotman, the penis that was here? You know, he, he, he said, you guys count up 613 commandments in the Jewish law and the law of Moses. He goes, I went through the fine tooth comb and I counted about 2009. And he goes, some are similar, but I counted 2,009. He goes, no one can keep the law. The law condemns all of us. And he was a fastidious Orthodox Jew. But he remember what he said, that he knew in his heart that he was a sinner, if you remember his testimony? He goes, I knew I lied. I knew that these lips lied. This heart lied. I knew I was a sinner. And it was Jesus Christ who freed him. And and I, I remember when I first met Sam, it, it was fun, he was sharing his sharing things with people. And there were some people that were <clears throat> Gentile trying to keep the Jewish law. And he says, no, no, no. He goes, he goes I, got, I, got, I got saved by Jesus Christ. I am free from the law. I've, I've been born again. I don't need the law. And he goes, matter of fact, three weeks after I got saved, I ate my first ham sandwich. And he goes, man, was it good. <laughs> <laughs> and he even married a Gentile. And his dad disowned him and went to his grave disowning him because his dad did not understand the purpose of the law. He, his dad thought the purpose of the law was to try to maintain and keep, but the purpose of the law is to show us that we're all held accountable, all under sin. And I know that we love, don't we love to classify sins? Do you realize he talks about homosexuality in there, but he also talks about lying? Has anybody here ever lied? Oh, I see that God holds all sin accountable. Yes, all sin. Jesus said, if you look, he was talking, you look at a woman and lust after, you've committed fornication in your heart, right? So guess what, guys? 
Have we all of us somehow committed fornication at one time or another? Come on. We're going to be honest? Yeah. So the, what is the standard of righteousness? It's the gospel. And that's what he said here. This is the sound doctrine according, verse 11, according to what? The glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Paul was saved by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ from the blessed God the Father. And this same message that he believed, that he embraced, it was committed to him. As marching orders from his commander, it gave to him, you are to go forth and preach the gospel, not only to the Jewish people, but the Gentiles as well. And that's what Paul did to his dying day. His feet kept on moving, and his mouth kept on talking, and his heart kept on giving. Because the mission was the message. The message was the mission. And then he, then he wants to go on to say, we can actually turn now to um, a couple slides ahead. Another one. Yeah. So we look at the gospel fruitfulness, and in, in, in Paul talks about this now. He, he's thinking of the gospel, and he's thinking of the effects that it had in Ephesus. Because when you go back to Ephesus, go back to Acts 18, and just see how the church was started in Ephesus, and man, were there miracles. The gospel, the gospel took off like wildfire there. So much so that that. Others were being persecuted for it by the religious leaders because it was a very, it was a very uh, idolatrous city. Anyway, now Paul reflects back and he's telling Timothy this, I, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. God saw me as having faith in Him and He's the one, Jesus Christ is the one who enabled me. He's the one that gave me the enabling to fight this fight, to fight this battle. We don't have it in ourselves. By nature, I am very self-centered. I'm very egotistical. I want to live for me. That is, that is my flesh. That is the old mark. Before I got saved, it, life was all about me and getting what I could. I might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I might die. It was Jesus Christ. I was not seeking Him at all. Not even a little bit. All of a sudden, he came into my life like a bomb dropped and my, my life was shaken up and I was saved. And I thank him that he's enabled me to preach the gospel, whether here or abroad, everywhere I have been, I've desired to preach the gospel because it's not location. The gospel can go all to all people, even here, and they need it here just as much as they do in East Africa. He enabled me, verse 13, although I was formerly a blasphemer, he blasphemed the name of Christ. He was a persecutor because he persecuted the church. He was an insolent man. He was an injurious man. He harmed others. He goes, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. He thought he was following the right way in Judaism and he was following the wrong way. But notice this. This is what was the change that took place in Paul. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Here we have the grace of our Lord it was exceeding abundant. It overabounded in Paul's life with the faith and love that are in Christ. We walk by faith in Jesus Christ and the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. And so we have this aroma. So as dead men, we have an aroma of stench. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in Christ, when we get saved, we have an aroma of what? It's beautiful. And God loves it. You know when we do you know who really loves it when we preach the gospel? Who really loves it when we preach the gospel? Don't think too hard. You know, in, in Sunday school, when you first come to Sunday school and kids and you're asking a question, it's either God, Bible, or Jesus. Okay, well, that's one of the three answers. So God loves it. He loves when the aroma of the gospel is shared. He loves it. He loves it. His message is going out like an aroma. And people are smelling that aroma. Paul says for some people it's going to be their condemnation, death unto death. But some people it's going to be life unto life. Jesus loves it when His gospel is preached. He rejoices more than we do. And angels are waiting for the conversion of that soul so they can have a party in heaven. 
Amen? Amen. That's what God desires. And so he said, the grace was exceeding abundantly with faith and love in Christ Jesus. This is verse 15. Paul says, now this is a faithful saying. This is not myth. This is fact. This is a faithful saying. And this is worthy of all acceptance. This is what's worthy to be embraced. If there is something to be embraced, it's not about genealogies. It's not about uh, godliness getting gain. This is what should be accepted, that Christ Jesus came into this world. Why? To save sinners, period. That is why Jesus came to this earth, was to save sinners. It wasn't to make us rich and famous. He wants sinners to be saved because I didn't come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners to repentance. And are we sinners? Yes. Everyone's a sinner. We're told to pray for our leaders. Why? Because God wants them to be saved. Yes. God wants our President Biden, to be saved. And I still pray for our past presidents to be saved. I do. I pray for Barack Obama and his dear wife and family to be saved. I don't want him going to hell. Have you ever thought of that? The Lord convicted me about that when I started whining about government one time. He brings me right to, right to uh, 1 Timothy here, chapter 2, keep on reading. And it talks about how our behavior should be among leaders. To pray for them to be saved. That we would live a quiet and peaceable life quiet and peaceable life, not loud and turbulent. If we're going to open our mouths up for something, let's open our mouths up for something that truly causes God's heart to rejoice. It is the message of the gospel. And that's why Paul says this, this is a faithful saying. This is worthy of all acceptance. Embrace this. God sent his son into this world to save sinners. And then Paul says this, of whom I am the very chiefest. I'm the worst. And if God can save me, who is the worst, who is an injurious man, who, who brought people to their death, who, who blasphemed Jesus Christ, are you any worse? No, you can be saved. Verse 16, however, for this reason I obtain mercy. Why? That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on Him for eternal life. Oh, wow. God purposefully did this in Paul's life that He would be an example to all of us. That God was patient with Paul. He was a murderer. He was a liar. He was a blasphemer. He, he was a violent man. And God was patient with him. God didn't strike him dead, did He? Could God have stricken him dead? He could have. But what did he do? He blinded him and made Paul fall to his face and humble himself and ask the question, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Is that long suffering? Is that grace? That is. That's the same long suffering and grace he's shown towards us. He's long suffering because he wants to show us as an example. So when I go to Africa, He wants to use me as an example of what long-suffering is to those that would come to believe. When I speak the Gospel in Fruta or in Grand Junction, it's an example for those who would come to believe. And that's why never be afraid when you're sharing your Gospel. Don't talk, act like you're this perfect person. We all know you're not. I'll just, if you, I'll just, husbands will ask your wives. Wives will ask your husbands. Or, oh, better not, we'll ask your kids. And they'll be saying, oh yeah, my parents aren't perfect. And I, some of my kids are here today and they'll tell you, oh yeah, dad, he has his days. He has had his days. Oh yeah, he's had to apologize to us because he doesn't do everything right. Be open, be honest, be transparent. Hey, Paul is here. But now, we can go to the next slide. And this is Peter. Peter has a heavy burden because Peter is seeing that in East Africa and Kenya, and his, what's happening is a prosperity gospel is ruining people's lives. He has such a heart for his people. He loves his people. He sacrifices for his people. He loves them dearly. But when he starts at, he started this last year, I've been encouraging him, ask people how they got saved. I tell them, ask them to share their testimony. But the prosperity gospel preachers, you know what they don't mention? They don't talk about our sinfulness. They don't talk about the need of repentance. 
They don't talk about we're called not to be kings, we're called to be slaves of Jesus Christ. The word doulos is the word for slave. We're slaves of Christ. They don't talk about these things. They talk about getting rich and having comfortable lives. That appeals to the sin nature, the flesh that we have. Paul, Peter sees what's going on in his country, and so he is purposefully sitting here very quietly as others are singing and dancing. He is trying to teach them that also worshiping Christ can be meditative. It doesn't have to be all emotion all the time. Because what, he, what happens, he goes, our people... What's happened because we worshipped idols and we worshipped the moon gods and the sun gods. When we heard the name Jesus, we, we thought, oh, he's a better God. So let's just bow the knee now to Jesus without repentance, without faith. So much of what they do, it's loud. They, they put Jesus on their vans because if a Jesus is on their van, then God will bless their van. There's very, they're very superstitious. Very superstitious. And he sees the superstition through the Pentecostal movement has, in the word of faith movement, has really hurt his people. And he's burdened for his people. He's trying to show them it is faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. Not an emotion or a feeling. Because he said they would all be all excited Sunday morning and things like that. Then they'd go home and he'd never know they're believers. They just go on living their life as normal, unchanged. Because they're using Jesus more as a genie rather than as their God. And that comes with the prosperity movement. So anyway, this is Peter. He, he is such a great man. Love this man. Anyway, I want you to notice this though. Paul is talking about his testimony. And then in verse 17, all of a sudden, he just breaks into a doxology. That's what he does. All of a sudden, he just breaks out into doxology. Verse 17, he says, Now to the King Eternal immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He can't help hold back. That is true worship. He's not trying to drum something up. And that's what often happens there. They try to get people excited. That's why their music is so loud. Yeah, sometimes you have to wear earplugs because they're trying to stir up an energy rather than have it come from a, a, a heart of humility and a heart of seeing God's grace so big. That Paul, this is a true worship right here in this doxology. Not of the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He can't hold it back. Well, Paul is, Paul is saying that even he himself is not wise. That only God alone is wise. Only God is wise. No one, if we have any wisdom at all, and we, as we know from Colossians 2, it comes from Jesus Christ, who is the treasure house of all wisdom and knowledge, it says. Anyway, and so now we can go to the next slide. He wants to charge. He's going to charge as a military commander. He says to Timothy, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy. And I will say this. It's hard to be a Timothy at times. I was at Timothy for many, 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 many years under Pastor Dan. And often Pastor Dan would have me do things and I'd want to do it differently. And he said, no, I think you should do it this way. I learned to follow Pastor Dan's wisdom that God has given to him. And the reason Timothy became such a great leader for the faith is because he was such a great son and disciple of the Apostle Paul. Because Paul shared his heart with Timothy, and Timothy embraced his heart. And Timothy wanted to use Paul as an example of what it was to walk by faith and what it was to be a soldier. And I will say this, and any of you who have been in the military, your best commanders and trainers are the ones that did it themselves, right? Are your best trainers the ones that sat and just read a book about it and told you to go out and do it? No. You know, often when I was an engineering technician for 20 years for the government, we would get, uh, uh, I, wasn't, I didn't have a degree in civil engineering, but we get a lot of civil engineers that sent under five years, five years of school in civil engineering, and we'd go out to do a job, and they wouldn't have the first clue what to do. So I, I as a technician, I would train the professionals because all of my was on-the-job training starting from out as a, a peon, as a GS1, working my way up to like a GS9. I was just, I, then that's what you do. And you learn the trade. And Timothy admitted that he, he would admit he needed Paul. And Paul now, as a commander, is charging him, Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. I want you to fight the good fight. There is a battle taking place. 
Life isn't about comfort. Life is about warfare. And you may not have the ability to wage the Word of God as some are gifted in preaching and teaching and the evangelism, but there's one thing we all can do. We all can get on our knees and pray, can we not? And as one old preacher said years ago, the early church moved forward on its knees. And that's what made it happen. God answering their prayers, not for, <laughs> not for riches, for souls. That's the only thing we can bring to heaven with us is souls. Um, and so, he says, having faith, he says this, again, having faith in Christ and a good conscience, being sensitive to what the Lord is leading you and teaching you to do, being sensitive to the Word of God and living out the Word of God, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I am delivered to Satan, that they would not learn to blaspheme. They were causing problems in the church. They were the ones with fables and endless genealogies that, that led to disputes and fighting rather than godly edification, which is in the faith. You know, there, there is... You can turn to the next slide. We just saw a verse there that talks about the reason we do this, the reason we go, is because I look at these little African children and I think, I want them to have pastors and parents that know Jesus and His Word. I want the faith to carry on I don't want it to die with the parents. And so it's so beautiful going there and training men and discipling men, walking their trails with them, seeing, living their life with them while we're there and realizing they're the next generation. It's for them. That's why we do it. That's why Jesus said, don't ever stop the little children from coming unto me for such is the kingdom of God. You can go to the last slide. Next slide. And there's some friends, new friends that Renee made. That's Pastor Herbert in the back. Pastor Herbert's quite another guy, but he's one of the older pastors there. But Mika, Mika is the one I told you about in the beginning. He is such a tender heart to the Lord. Such a tender heart. He is so hungry for the Word right now. And um, I want to thank Stanley for getting up some of the stuff going on. We have a, a YouTube place now we can do videos and put them up on youtube and the men can access those but this is the shirt he gave me as i left and i brought it home i brought the shirt home and as i was putting it away and putting on a hanger he actually had this little note inside the shirt so he knew i wouldn't see it until i got back dear dad it's high time for me to take this small opportunity to write this small note to you just to say goodbye or say bye-bye it has been a great week for to me to be with you and also to thank you for your spiritual teachings and blessings that you've given to me. Know that your son Mika will miss you big. Your son is always praying for you that the Lord God Almighty expand your ministry and the teaching the whole world the Word of God and to know the truth about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Safe journey, Dad. Send my greeting back to America. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Your son, Mike Mika, praying for you to Dad Mark.